Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sigma 14mm f1.4 DG DN Art, an ultra wide angle lens with a bright aperture designed for full frame mirrorless cameras. In fact, it's the fastest non fisheye 14 to date, making it perfect for astrophotography, but also ideal for dim interiors or making dramatic photos or videos. At the time I made this review, it was available for Sony E and Leica L mounts, the latter working on Panasonic Lumix S bodies. Come on, Canon and Nikon, your systems would really benefit from opening fully to third party lenses like these. Can I get an Amen in here? Announced in June 23 and costing around $1,600 or £1,400, the 141.4 becomes the sixth and widest DGDN mirrorless lens in Sigma's high end art series, joining the existing 20. 24, 35, 50 and 85 models, all sharing the same fast f1.4 apertures. If you're an L-mount owner, the Sigma 14 1.4 is pretty unique, with only Panasonic's own 14 to 28 extending as wide in a true native mount, albeit as a zoom with a much dimmer f4 to 5.6 aperture. Sigma also have their older 14 1.8 prime and 14 to 24 2.8 zooms, but if you're in Sony's E-mount system, by far the biggest rival will be Sony's own FE 14mm 1.8 G Master, which arrived two years previously and costs roughly the same at around $1,400 to $1,500 or pounds. I reviewed Sony's 14 1.8 back then, and even two years later, it represents very tough competition, an excellent performer at a similar price. So Sigma's new 14 1.4 better be good. In my review, I'll show you what it can do and how it compares. First things first, in a world when many new lenses are touted as being smaller or lighter, the Sigma 14 1.4 is unapologetically substantial. Measuring just over 100 mm in diameter and 150 mm long, it makes Sony's 14 1.8 look pretty compact. More dramatic though is the weight. At 1.17 kilograms, the Sigma is more than double the weight of the Sony, making it much less practical for handheld or gimbal work, so you really have to want that slightly brighter aperture. Just look at the Sony 14 in comparison. Sure, it's not quite as bright at f1.8, but it sure is considerably more compact and usable handheld. Sigma realizes this and pitches the 14 1.4 as being optimized for astrophotography, where you'll be typically shooting from a tripod. Indeed, it's supplied with a collar and tripod foot, sensibly taking the strain rather than your camera's lens mount. The collar allows you to rotate the barrel, albeit sadly lacking any tactile feedback at 90 degree intervals. But in some constellation, the foot does have an Arca Swiss dovetail, allowing you to slide it right into a compatible clamp. And if you are hand holding the lens, you can also remove this collar and foot to reduce the load a little. Now this does reveal some mounting holes around the barrel, but in the first of a number of small but considerate moves, Sigma supplies a rubber ring to cover them up and also to present a tidier looking barrel. Closest to the lens mount is an aperture ring from f1.4 to 16 in one third increments with a lockable A position for body base control. Like other art lenses and the Sony, this is declickable for smooth and silent adjustments. Towards the end of the barrel is a very smooth and well damped manual focusing ring and sandwiched between this and the aperture ring are three switches and a button. From top to bottom, there's a switch for auto or manual focus, a customizable AF lock button, a switch that handily disables the manual focusing ring altogether, and finally the switch to declick the aperture ring. Unlike many lenses that you might use for astrophotography, the Sigma 14 is designed specifically for it with a number of considerate features. Now you already know about the switch that disables the manual focusing ring entirely, thereby preventing any unwanted knocks once you've painstakingly set it to infinity. Recognizing the risk of condensation during a long night of astrophotography, Sigma's also included a ridge around the end of the barrel to help secure heating strips in place, or at least prevent them from slipping. Like most ultra wide lenses, there's a built in petal hood, but unlike the usual friction based caps of models like the Sony 14, Sigma's designed one that can actually clip onto the end of the barrel and stay in place. Better still, the spring loaded mechanism in the cap also doubles as storage on the inside for a pair of soft filters. Yet, like most lenses with this kind of bulbous front element, the 14 1.4 accommodates filters at the mount end and Sigma supplies a stencil for you to cut out your own. Now this is no different to the Sony 14, but the ability to store a couple of these filters in the cap is a really nice touch. As an art lens that's also made in Japan, it won't surprise you that the build quality on the Sigma 14 is excellent and it's weather sealed throughout. 
So while the lens is undeniably substantial, especially with the tripod foot, maybe think about it as being reassuringly hefty and designed to excel at a job. And while Sigma does pitch it for distant astrophotography, you'll also see that it performs very well in daylight, near and far, and even for vlogging if you dare. I'm gonna show you all of that. Okay, so let's start with focusing. And you see in the Sigma 14 1.4 on the Sony a7 IV, which I've used for all my tests here. This is a single AF area, first in single AFS mode, where the lens is focusing very quickly and confidently without a wobble. Switch the camera to continuous AFC mode and it looks equally good to me and also similar to what I found with the Sony 14 1.8. For good measure, here's the same test for video, again on the a7 IV in continuous AFC mode and again showing confident refocusing between the bottle close to the lens and the wall behind it. Next we're focus breathing test with the lens close to f16 and manually focusing from infinity to the closest distance and back again. You'll notice the field of view doesn't actually change that much when you look at the edges, but unusually that barrel distortion becomes more pronounced, making the center appear to stretch further away into the distance. Now this isn't exactly ideal unless you like that warp drive or vertical style special effect, but equally it's something that you're unlikely to come across when using the lens under normal conditions. That said, here's how the Sony 14 looks in comparison, which exhibits a much more conventional reduction in the overall field of view without that stretching effect. Okay, now for my Sigma 14 1.4 optical results, and I wanted to start by showing an image taken straight from the camera without any lens corrections applied. And now for one with distortion compensation set to auto in the Sony menus, which is how this lens is meant to be used. As I toggle between these images, you'll see that there's actually minimal correction taking place considering the extreme nature of the lens, just a mild tweak to compensate for some barrel distortion with an equally mild crop as a result. When I compare the coverage with compensation applied, it looks essentially identical to the coverage delivered by the Sony 14 1.8, so there's no compromise here to worry about. From this point on though, all my results are shown with distortion compensation set to auto, which again is how this lens is designed to be used. Sigma says the lens is optimized for distant subjects like Astro, and I'll be showing you some of that in just a moment, but this should also make it very adept at landscapes. So here's my standard test scene, which you can compare against the same view in my other reviews. It's angled so that details run into the corners. You're looking at the lens wide open at f1.4 here, and if we zoom in for a closer look in the middle of the frame where the camera is focused, you'll see a tremendous amount of detail, and there's no significant boost to be gained by closing the aperture any further. Heading out into the far corner unsurprisingly results in some darkening due to vignetting, but there's minimal loss of sharpness here with excellent detail right out of the gate. As you close the aperture, one stop at a time here, the vignetting quickly lifts, leaving a clean looking frame with a mild boost in detail at around f5.6 to f8. Now, if you're shooting a landscape, you'll enjoy the best results with the aperture closed down a little to around this point, but the headline here is that the lens is performing very well at the maximum aperture. Indeed, comparing my results from the Sony 14 1.8 shows both lenses delivering similar detail and sharpness across the frame and wide open, albeit 1.4 for the Sigma and 1.8 for the Sony. To see how this translates to astrophotography, I headed up to the South Downs, the nearest darkish location to where I'm based in Brighton. Here's a five second exposure at 400 ISO with the lens wide open to f1.4, where you can see the summer sky, young moon and light pollution of Brighton all conspiring against me, but there's still some stars visible and I've boosted the whites and the highlights on the raw file to make them clearer here. The detail in the middle is well corrected, as you'd expect, and moving into the far corner also shows the stars remaining well behaved. I'd say this is an excellent result for the Sigma lens, proving that it's a desirable option for wide field astrophotography. But so's the Sony 14 1.8, seen here from pretty much the same location, albeit at a different time of year, and mounted on the Alpha 1 versus the a7 IV, which I use for the Sigma tests. Plays the corner crops of the Sigma on the left and the Sony on the right, when both lenses are wide open, shows little to choose between them. Although with an aperture that's two thirds of a stop faster, the Sigma will allow correspondingly shorter exposures or lower ISOs as a result. And also don't forget those extra physical features on the Sigma like the manual focus lock, wide focusing range, filter holder, and that ridge to stop a heat strip from slipping. These all make it more desirable for Astro overall. Next for a quick portrait shot, taken as a selfie with the 14 1.4, of course wide open to 1.4, we can get an idea not just of the broad coverage, but also the shallow depth of field in the background. 
looking closer shows the focused areas to be crisp and the blurred ones to be satisfyingly rendered, even with this potentially busy background. Despite the heft of the lens, I couldn't resist trying it out for a quick vlogging test, here using IBIS sensor shift stabilisation on the a7 IV alone, and what really struck me here was the almost three-dimensional look to the image. For a steadier result, here's some footage filmed with active steady shot on the a7 IV, which takes a small crop in return for additional digital compensation. The view was so wide to start with that the crop version is still pretty expansive. Now I initially filmed this as a bit of a laugh as I couldn't imagine anyone actually seriously vlogging with a lens this size but the results looked so good I repeated the test in the lanes of Brighton where again you'll see that almost 3D pop of the subject with a beautifully rendered background behind it. And again indulge me with both IBIS and Active Steady Shot taking that mild crop to deliver smoother footage. Now the size and weight of the lens makes it less than ideal for this kind of thing but I really loved the look of the results so I just wanted to show you here. Now the lens may be optimised for distance subjects but it still turns in respectable performance at close range. Here my ruler was photographed from the minimum focusing distance, quoted as 30cm, where the lens has reproduced just under 30cm across the frame. And when close to f8 here, the results are pretty crisp too, right up to the edges. From this distance, the large aperture can also deliver more background blur than you might expect. Here's my ornament test from near to the closest focusing distance again with the aperture wide open and taking a closer look reveals mostly well behaved bokeh blobs. There's minor textures in some of them but it's nothing like the onion ringing of others and there's no outlining to mention really. As I close the aperture one stop at a time you'll see the shades becoming more uniform across the frame and occasionally hinting at the geometric shape of the 11 bladed diaphragm system. For comparison here's mild crops from the Sigma on the left and the Sony 14 1.8 on the right, both at their maximum apertures and closest focusing distances. They were taken at different times and slightly different angles, but you can see their rendering styles are quite similar here, albeit with slightly larger blobs from the Sigma, as you'd expect from its slightly larger aperture. Do you have a preference? At the other end of the scale, here's the Sigma 14 close to f16 and pointed at the sun, where you can see the aperture blades delivering well-defined diffraction spikes. And for comparison, here's the Sigma on the left versus the Sony on the right, both at f16 and clearly on different days, but again you can see their diffraction spikes looking pretty similar here. Just for fun, here's a video demonstration of the Sigma's full aperture range from 1.4 to 16 and back again, with the aperture declicked for smooth operation, where you can see the impact of the diaphragm system with point sources of light, albeit a slightly fuzzier one here due to the conditions. In fact, while Sigma is keen to keep telling you that the lens is optimised for astrophotography, I had a great time filming with it day and night, even handheld. You've already seen how good it is for filming pieces to camera, but it was equally effective for huge dramatic views or tight interiors, and again with some opportunity for shallow depth of field effects from close range. Which now brings me to my final verdict, during which I'll show you a bunch of photos that I took with the Sigma 14 1.4 on a Sony a7 IV body, all JPEGs out of camera here. As always, you can find some of the original images on my review page for the lens at cameralabs.com if you'd like a closer look. The Sigma 14 1.4 is not just the fastest non-fisheye 14 to date, but delivers excellent performance wide open, across the frame, and near to far. Point it at distant stars and you'll enjoy pin sharp images right into the corners, even at f1.4, which means it's also ideal for big landscape and architectural views. Approach the minimum focusing distance and you can enjoy some nice shallow depth of field effects, while closing the aperture down delivers nice sharp diffraction spikes. On top of this, you're getting a substantial weather sealed lens with a tripod foot and a bunch of considerate features for astrophotography, including a wide focusing range, manual focus lock, storage for cutout filters in the cap, and a ridge to stop heated strips from slipping. On the downside, this is an unapologetically large lens, weighing over a kilogram, and the focus breathing does reveal some interesting distortions, although you're unlikely to come across them in day-to-day -day use. I'd say it's pretty much unchallenged in the L mount, but the biggest issue for Sony owners is the fact that you can buy Sony's own 14 1.8 G Master for pretty much the same money. In my test, the Sigma matched its optical quality, no mean feat against a modern G Master lens, plus the Sigma is two thirds of a stop faster and has those considerate features for astrophotographers too. But the Sony lens is less than half the weight, making it more flexible to use handheld and especially when mounted on, say, a modest gimbal or even a small star tracker. 
Given they're roughly the same price, it's a tough call. I think the weight of the Sony makes it more desirable for general use in filming, but exacting astrophotographers will be happy to accommodate the heft of the Sigma for its larger aperture, the useful tripod mount, and those extra features I keep mentioning. Ultimately, it comes highly recommended and bonus points if you're actually thinking about using it for vlogging. And that's it for another lens review. If you find what I do useful, please do consider giving it a like and my channel a follow. And if you're feeling extra generous, I'm always up for a coffee or you could treat yourself to a Camera Labs t-shirt or a copy of my in-camera photography book. There's links to everything, including the latest pricing on the lens below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.